All right. Uh, well, thank you for the hyperbole, Dave. Um, uh, I'm going to be walking really stiff because it, it turned out that there's something, there's a physiological problem I have where I can't have a microphone stick to my face. So prepare for it to fall off at some point. Uh, I think uh, the point of today's talk is for me to give you the examples of where we were funny, which actually only makes up about 30% of what my business does, and allow people to appreciate the fact that the roots of humor in my brand are things that inform how we do beautiful, how we do inspiring, how we do uh, thought-provoking. And you'll see examples of that on Beta Brand, and you'll see a lot of crotch and vagina jokes here today. So the web. <laughs> uh, it's important for everybody to remember that no matter where your business is on the internet, Goatsy is only one click away. And it's important for people to understand that this is the medium that we operate in, uh, where there's this great appreciation where, <laughs> where no matter what you sell on the internet, you literally are in an environment that's not, so I run a clothing company, it's not the shopping mall. The internet's disgusting. And if this is where you choose to set up a business, you have to abide by the fact that you're operating in an environment that doesn't behave like Main Street. It doesn't behave... <laughs> this, this, this is a product we sell on our site. I don't sell this product on our site. We have it up there so we can make jokes. It's called Not Safe for Workwear. Um, so the idea, now you can see the, uh, the tape is coming off. Uh, the question, and when we look at these things, you can ask yourself, well, how does a clothing company organize itself when it operates on the internet? where the objective is to hold on to people's attention and to realize that, once again, there's always something more interesting that people can click away to. So how do you behave? All right, so one, photography. This isn't something my company created. This is what a fan sends to us. There's this constant reminder that if I only have models that look like you know, the, the standard square-jawed Scandinavian supermodels that you see in some place like Banana Republic, you're not going to hold people's attention online. Secondly, embrace the fact that the world you're operating in is always asking you to be more interesting. And so we get photos galore, about 50,000 so far, from customers that demonstrate the way that people wear our stuff online. And it goes further to say, by saying this is an internet company, you have weird things every now and then popping up in your inbox where you have a customer of yours wearing your clothing meeting Kim Jong-un. It's important always for us to remember that part of the story, much like being a funny person, is not just the, the, the humor that you create, but the relationship that it has with the audience you have. So uh, everyone that's up here talking thinks about that all the time. It's just not just the content, but the relationship that it has with the people on the other side. So for us, it's about always saying the audience is the most important thing. And for our business, we say the audience must have a very prominent position on our website. Uh, I, I show this as an important example, particularly for all the women in the audience, that as much as I'm going to talk about the things that we do that are funny, our number one product are dress pant yoga pants. Yoga pants you can wear to the office. Great product, the majority of our business. And so it may help the people here who work in software and services or technology to remember that we're also a business that sells regular stuff but we also approach communication online with a sense of whimsy that allows a lot of free traffic to come to our website. Okay, so fashion forwardability. That is a, a figure of speech I coined to manage everybody who works for Betabrand. There's about 80 people there. And if you're a designer, a photographer, a marketer, a copywriter, anything, you have to always be saying, how do we engineer some forwardable unit of anything into the products we put out, be it the copy, be it the photos, be it the name, et cetera, et cetera. It's the standard we hold ourselves up to. Uh, the first products we put out uh, about 12 years ago, I created a product called quarter rounds. They're horizontal corduroy pants. And I sold them by focusing on the crotch heat index. <laughs> so as you can imagine, aerodynamics are a benefit of horizontal corduroy pants. But more importantly, it has to do with the incredible amount of heat that is generated as a man walks along in the crotch. As you can imagine, this stuff is made for the internet because if we had just, again, photographed them on a handsome man and said, come be fashionable, 
the New York Times wouldn't have written about the, the site one week after it went live. That happened. And of course, the first year that I was in business selling stuff uh, out the same house that I lived in with Dave in the basement, uh, it was covered in every conceivable news media because I was the one who had the audacity to turn corduroy another direction. <laughs> Not really the most important news, but people who have to write news are hunting for content. And you, when you find them in a day that there's no news, they will gladly write about your stupid clothing company. All right, so number two product. We started off with men and we moved on to women. So we talked about Vagisoft. That being the second softest thing in the universe, uh, we find that pseudoscience is something that we can always lean on as a company because it has this quality that's good for the internet to demonstrate. And I'm proud to say that I'm the first clothing company that ever explored the softness of the anus of a silkworm. <laughs> All right, so this is off now. I think there's a microphone that may come down for me. I'll hold it like this until then. All right, next up. Uh, poo. The poo emoji is the most trafficked substance on the internet. It really is. I mean, if you think about things from the clothing point of view, I know for certain, and we're on to this one. Hello? All right. I know for certain that there are more poo emojis trafficked online every day than swooshes or polo ponies. So wouldn't it just be natural that we would then be the first to make clothing out of poo emojis? Logically, it's been covered all over the world. And both men and women are able to enjoy these fashions. <laughs> Next up, and it's an important thing, you'll hear about this all the time, user-generated content, user-generated content. So we're the business that said, why, when I can come up with these clothing ideas with a person with no background in fashion, shouldn't I then invite everybody who shops at our business to do the same? So Beta Brand operates like Kickstarter for clothing, and we have a brand new product that comes up on our site every day out of about 10 to 20 that are submitted by people every day. So again, nonstop ideas, nonstop ideas. And sometimes they are really popular. Uh, the Suitsi is a, uh, a concept that was brought to us by this man, and he designed a suit that you can zip on and off. And he has been on a nonstop global press tour about this product that Beta Brand only sells, that has him meeting, you know, I think he's on some TV show this summer. He's been on all the morning talk shows. He's the guy who created the Suitsi, and he's great. And I didn't think of it. I didn't think of any of the things he's done to promote it. All we did is give him a stage. So it's an important thing to note that we as a business that sells very nice clothing for women also have a piece of our business that says, come up with crazy stuff, go out and promote it yourself, and we will make everything for you. Okay, business communication. So these are examples of how we've looked at stuff that you all have to deal with as business communicators and done it slightly differently to great effect. One, motto. When I started as a one-person business, my motto was that an evil multinational corporation has to start somewhere for now pants. A lot of times people get caught up in their own sense of grandeur when they're starting companies of how they're going to change the world, how they're going to, you know, free people and liberate them in the way that they use data. We had a very... <laughs> There's a great humility in saying, no, our objective is to be a gigantic, awful company but there's only one of us working here right now, and I sell pants for a living. Because you gotta remember, Halliburton probably started as a mom and pop store somewhere. And they had the good fortune of being able to grow to be that evil company. And it also helps the fact that this was the original motto of our business at the same time that Google decided to not be evil. Uh, it's fun to think of us as the uh, black hat in that, in, in that battle. All right. Uh, there's a lot of ways that people look at their websites. Like it has to be this thing that only portrays their brand in the most positive light. We found that when the triple X domain came out, this was about four years ago, the problem that journalists had is it was big news to talk about now there's a triple X domain. But if you're a CNN reporter, you can't be like, yes, bigdongs.triplex is the thing we're gonna link to in our article. 
because you can't do that. They can't promote pornography, but they can write about it. So we quickly, quickly created a jokey triple X version of our website that then became the point of reference for every story about the triple X domain. That was just, just saying, hey, actually, here's an opportunity here. When you write about something that you're forbidden to link to, come up with a parody version that all of them will link to. So we got a ton of traffic, and people were purchasing clothing from our triple X website. And the joke with the triple X website is it was filled with all kinds of pop-ups that were talking about uh, fashion in a very safe for work manner. But again, when you think about it, that was us sort of hacking a news story. And a lot of the things that you'll see is how we look at evolving news stories and find a way to insert our company into them. Uh, products. Uh, the products that you have on your site don't have to be real. Uh, they just have to be referential for some purpose. So we created adult, adult undergarments, and this was our April Fool's joke. I think one of the things that's tough, a lot of people here have probably come up with April Fool's jokes for their companies. It's a very hotly competitive world. Uh, you know, Google created this entire culture of the news story around the April Fool's joke. I love April Fool's because it's this chance to watch an entire world of marketing departments try to outdo each other, and it's actually great. I love it. I love it. It's a bad way to ultimately sell stuff. It's not a way to get a ton of traffic to your site because there's a ton of noise, but we've always been able to find our way uh, high up on the list of things by coming up with the cheapest things we can. So for this, this time, it was adult, adult undergarments, which you can see just how sexy they are. <clears throat> All right, another thing that's important is that I've, uh, anyone here who's had to recruit anybody knows that... Uh, it's a painful process where you're likely going to be charged, you know, $25,000 to hire a new engineer just because that there's a nonstop slew of uh, recruiters that are, that are holding the keys to every engineer in the valley. Painful thing, costs money, what do we do? So we say, all right, engineers, let's go ahead and create the worst homepage ever for our website. It'll be something that harkens back to the worst design you saw in Lycos or GeoCities, and we're going to have our, that be our homepage for the week. So. For one, most people know who run web businesses know that the home page often isn't the most trafficked page on your website. It's other pages within it. So for us, it's not a big deal for us to say, OK, we'll give up our 10th most popular page and make it really stupid and then see what happens. Well, logically, you create the worst UX experience on planet Earth, and then it becomes news story among the UX community. And then you have a slew of resumes come in from UX people who appreciate the joke. Ta-da, and it's fun for the engineers, and we got all our hires in. We didn't have to spend money, so we saved $25,000 by creating a really ugly homepage. And I can tell you that traffic to that homepage went up enormously that week because we were the ones to say, who cares about how perfect a homepage looks when anyone who's, who's smart enough can understand that it's a joke. Next up. All right, so we're also good at, as I said, inserting ourselves in a comic manner, into news stories. So HP says, engineers can no longer wear t-shirts to work. And then that morning, we filmed all of our engineers doing a recruiting ad wearing you know, really stupid t-shirts <laughs> about how they have the freedom to come work at Betamrand instead. And of course, logically, we become inserted into this news story that matters a lot to the technology world, where we're the fashion story. So again, great press, lots of, lots of engineers then applied for jobs at Betamrand. OK, another important thing, and I wish I could give you more examples. I wish, wish, wish I could give you more examples of this. So I really, really wish I could give more examples of this. And, it, and, it, and I, I would say, you yeah, just ought to follow Betabrand or Twitter or become a Facebook fan of Betabrand, is that we have a long, very proud history of saying, of course you're going to get trolled every day online. But we do not ever engage in face-to-face -face battle with, with trolls. We always redirect the conversation to something stupider. And the result is, and I mean it, it's this Aikido Jiu-Jitsu thing that my friend Anthony, who does most of our social media, I do it too, are, have become very good at over time. And I can promise you that we have an amazing track record of taking the people who show up to be assholes and turning them into fans because we made a point of saying, OK, all right, let's joke around. And it's not about making them look stupid. It's just shifting the conversation in a direction that is objectively funny. And then what you get is great fans from the fans that you know 
would otherwise smack that person down. But you can turn that person to be like, okay, all right, well, they're funny. They, there's this, you know, they're not going to fight back. They're going to fight back by being funny. So I think that it's worth thinking about all the time. And if you want a good example, you should actually watch Beta Brand's Twitter feed and Facebook feed. Because I would say every day, uh, and again, it's a guy named Anthony Jaffe, he mints some amazing retort to some asshole who comes up to call us hipsters or idiots or a product of ours stupid, and that's just fine. That's the environment, again, that we live in. Remember, goat sees one click away, et cetera. You're going to have t trolls every day who talk about what you do, and instead of getting offended by it, we play with them. Uh, so Beta Brand has had a long and ongoing war on Christmas <laughs> because we know that during the holiday season, it's great to get any amount of press you possibly can or any attention because it helps you sell more stuff. Now, we also are aware of just how terrible companies have come in years and years where you now see uh, Christmas creeping up to Halloween. So we've gone as far as made a video game that involves a fight between <laughs> icons of Christmas and Halloween. And all these things have gotten us enormous amount of press. And it comes at a great time when we want to make money. So we're kind of like the bad guy of the, hol of the holidays. Uh, we have a, uh, a guy named Santa the Hut that you saw. I can't go back here. So that was Santa the Hut you saw originally. Uh, people come by to get family photos with them over the holidays. So anyone who's sort of sick of the holidays going too far, they can come shop at our site and we support them. Uh, so there's thousands and thousands of family photos with Santa the Hut. And then, you know, I don't know, uh, New York Times did a story on this a couple of years ago when we put it out. But it was really a story that we knew as part of a greater context. We as marketers know just how awful all other <laughs> companies are about trying to start Black Friday in September. But, so there, it, it's just a fact. It's just an awful thing that our industry does. Like it creeps up further every day. So we figured it was a fun thing to have Dracula and, and Santa face off at long last. Uh, last year's joke was we created platypus eggnog for sale in front of our store because we know that the food community would be outraged and the, 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 the anti-tech community would be outraged by the fact that we were selling $35 platypus eggnog in front of our store. And as a result, it became a giant debate in the food community and the the gentrification community about how Beta Brand is, has the audacity to serve such a thing. <laughs> the people who we like knew it's a joke. And the people who just want to complain about something would never shop at our site anyway. So thank you, angry people, for amplifying our brand image. OK, how to become a creative magnet. It's an important thing, because it has to do with how you and your business can uh, sort of say it's a valuable thing to invest in being funny or being thought provocative. Uh, so we, as a result of all these efforts, have attracted all kinds of people who want to build the beta brand with us. And that's an important thing. So here you have uh, many women that are uh, comedians have all been models for our website. And we purposely said, hey, comedy writers are great, and you ought to get to know them. Uh, this, this is the funny part of us starting and launching our women's line where we only had PhDs as models. And that was huge, huge news for our business. And it actually has enabled us, that was a catalyst that turned our entire following from 90% men to 70% women in under two, under two years. So it's a significant thing. Th that investment paid off enormously. So we're a company that wants to have the brainiest women being our fans. Why? Because they write better than people who are not. And they're the ones who write good reviews uh, and use great words in doing so. And, it, and it's, it, you know, again, it's not that surprising when you hear these things to have educated women being your fans that works pretty well on the internet because they're the ones that have audiences. Uh, so Margaret Cho, you know, a lot of times in the fashion world, it's an awful thing. My inbox is filled every day with people saying, oh, am I at zero? I don't know if this is counting down. Dave, is it time? Okay, well, there we go. I'm done. There you go. <laughs> Colbert's wore the stuff. We become a news source. And then, hey, here's a big event that's coming up. Here's an event that's coming up. Silicon Valley Fashion Week. 
Uh, we'll do the Q&A stuff. I can get to some of those points. All right, Silicon Valley Fashion Week is something that we put on last year. I decided that we would do it about six weeks beforehand. Filled this place up for three nights. It's an unbelievable event. If your companies want to be involved in something that is just kinetically, monstrously, creatively bananas, that is what happens in, in the end of October. And it's basically saying, we will create a runway for the, for the Burning Man movement, for the maker movement, for anyone who's got something creative that they want to show on stage. And that's why it comes with a question mark afterwards, logically. It's, it allows the fashion world to say, it must be terrible fashion. So I'm going to come cover it. And then all those people are blown away when San Francisco freaks them out with fiber optics and amazing LED lighting and all the things that we as technology people do so well that all the people in the traditional fashion world doubt we can do. So what's fun about that event is there's a little bit of stick in the middle finger at the fashion world and a lot of us saying, hey, we're really creative people here. And that's what makes the show so fun. Anyhow, questions, please. Hi, just kidding, just kidding. Can we get a discount at the store if we show our funny biz bracelet? Absolutely, 20% off. Yay! For the next five minutes. <laughs> go. No, I, yeah, today, please. Just say funny business. Right here. Here we go. One, two, Say whatever three. you want, and we'll give you 20% off today. Hi. Uh, what were you going to say about Stephen Colbert? Oh, I mean, I, it's the creative magnet. We have, as it turns out, what's terrible about the world of fashion is there's always someone writing you saying, I represent C-list actor so-and-so. And for the price of $15,000, she'll put on your pants. It's awful. So we, we ignore that. If you're a celebrity, we assume you're rich and you can buy your own stuff. So we have all kinds of, you know, every major late night host of a show owns beta brand clothing and has paid for it. And that's the thing that I think that's significant is that we make stuff and we speak in a language. We're trying to be as good as we can be. And the result is you're only rewarded for doing so. And so you get to have the famous people wear your stuff without having to deal with their awful handlers who want to make money off of it. All right. OK, so um, I know you're on your way to becoming an evil multi-conglomerate, started out as one person. But at a certain point, you must be hiring writers. So my question is, like, at what point in your business did you decide, like, okay, we need to start hiring external people and paying them money, which I guess is another way of asking, how does this scale up? Good question. Uh, I have faith in English degrees. Uh, I really do. Um, we do have people who write for the business, and they do great. And I, and I, and I just sort of think that there's, if there's a volume of material for them to look at, uh, anyone who's talented enough can read it and learn and understand the cadence, the voice, uh, use of hyperbole, you know, word choice, etc. Uh, so we haven't had big problems with that. There still is. A right. Well, I mean, there's 80 people who work there, and I would sort of say there's probably 20 of whom op, uh, exist in creative roles at the business. And so my job is to train and teach and. Uh, Inspire. Oh, about a hundred thousand. I'm not kidding. It's about that many. So that that's that's the point where we started to have a staff of creative people who weren't necessarily me. I mean, there are people who worked with me collaboratively, but I think the buck stopped with me creatively for a long time. All done. Okay. Out of time here. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you one quick question. Like, you have a lot of creative, uh, you have a lot of creative things on the site. What's something that was on the bubble that didn't quite make the cut? That is like always held a place in your heart that you wish you could have made, but you just decided you couldn't. Um, you know, on a t uh, wish we designed or or like jokes that didn't work. Either way. All right. Well, jokes that didn't work. I mean, I the guy with the cutout nipples on his shirt. We <laughs> thought we thought not safe for work wear would be. A would get along around the web more. And it, it, it's ended up being this long joke we've used whenever people are complaining on our uh, Facebook and Twitter feeds. We send people to that instead. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, on, there's just a ton. Honestly, it, it's every day. We publish every day. And I would say, quite honestly, I'm, I'm cherry picking all the biggest successes. There's tons of things that just, you know, fall flat. All right, cool. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you.